he's totally lying about the doors. They are locked. <laughs> <laughs> and yes, he has totally thrown it. Zidia has totally thrown me under the bus because nothing worse for a speaker than telling the audience, really, she's going to do this in Sweden and you are trial bunnies. <laughs> so, might as well admit it and uh, ask you for a favour at the end. And that is, I would like to have feedback. And by that, I mean actual, real feedback, because any mistakes I make now, I don't want to repeat them in front of Swedish people. That works. <laughs> don't say that. <laughs> okay. okay. What I'd like to do first is ask all of you to go a little bit back with me in time. Not too much. But year 2019, pre COVID, COVID doesn't exist. The word pandemic hasn't entered our vocabulary just yet. Economy, woohoo. People like us, we can basically get whatever job we like. And agile's hot ass. Ways of working, it's going splendidly. Agile's taking off, we have small autonomous teams, and by autonomous, I don't mean do whatever. By autonom autonomous, I mean within constraint, supporting a company, but people who have agency and decision-making power. Leadership, we've moved a long way from command and control to collaborative leadership, to working together and actually listening to each other. Great times. And then, boom, this happened. And from one day to the next, we're all thrown into working from home, lockdowns, and all that stuff. And much has happened since. Many of us have returned, to, have returned to an office again, and other things have happened. But I do believe that this was the beginning of a trajectory change for our ways of working. And that trajectory, I believe, has not been one for the better. I think we have lost a lot of our autonomy and agency ever since. And by the way, in this talk, I'm not going to tell you what to do about it, but I want to start a conversation about it. And I'm going to leave you with three things that you can try and that you can hopefully tell me about how they're going for you. And also, apart from the feedback, I'm going to ask you about, about uh, another favour before you leave. I'll come back to that later. So this is me, Oxford. And I was just reflecting recently about how much of my life had changed since 2019. I live mostly at the beach. I've taken up surfing. Pretty shit, as you can see it from the eight foot foam board surfboard, but I love it. I work a lot less because actually there's a recession going on, not that much work around. So my life has changed. And I actually want to do a quick check if you might have changed. Who has moved since 2019? Who has moved to city? Country, okay, but the answer country. Wow, where are you from? Uh, I'm from Pakistan and moved from UAE to here recently last month. Okay, cool. And what about you? Um, from Canada, I've been traveling 11 years, so I like invert COVID. Yeah. Invert COVID, nice. Invert COVID. Okay, who's changed jobs? Who has lost a job in one of those gazillions of restructures? Yeah. Heaps of us. And lots of our lives have changed. And it's not just our physical circumstances that have changed. It's also us. We as people have changed. We're not the same anymore. 
We're the first generation for a really, really long time in the Western world that have gone through collective trauma and private change. And if you look at the world right now, there is a recession, inflation, there are climate events going on, there's flooding, there's fires, wildfires in Australia. Technology, for a first time in a long time, people who work in technology actually don't have 100% job security. And another technology thing, um, AI is going to change our societies, it's going to change our jobs and the way we work. So lots of circumstances are changing and we change as people. We're not the same people we were in 2019. And of course, this has had an impact on our workplaces. And especially the relationships that we see in our workplaces. And that's what I want to go deeper in with my talk today. And a lot of research has been done investigating people, um, employees' happiness and wellness and um, hybrid working and how employees work. And that's a great thing. But the part that I was missing was the perspective from our leaders. Very few have looked into how our leaders feel and how they experience what's currently going on in the workplace. I'm not a leader myself. If you follow me, that's your problem. <laughs> so what I did is I talked to leaders. I interviewed leaders from a variety of sectors and industries. I interviewed leaders from Europe, the US, Australia, and New Zealand. And people within the public sector, and also the private sector. CEOs, product managers, high level public servants, general managers, and I tried to get as broad a perspective as I possibly could. And what was really, really interesting was that every single one of the leaders I interviewed said the same thing. The number one thing they all came up with is this. They look around in their organisations, people are more fragile. People are fragile, they're fearful, and they're more self-absorbed than ever. And I found this fascinating and started to dig into, well, is it just them or is there actually some research behind this? Can we prove this? And let me start out with New Zealand stats are a bit shit. The years 2022 and 2023 are not out yet. So I used a proxy because um, it's not going to leave this room, but Australia and New Zealand Pretty much the same. <laughs> <laughs> Just leave now. <laughs> yeah, you can help me down afterwards. But um, looking at Australia, 2018, 13% report anxiety. 2023, number is up to 17.2. And the last one I found super alarming, which is 42% had experienced a mental disorder during their lifetime. And the trend's going upwards. And I think this is a really, really scary thing that almost half of the people in Australia, most likely in New Zealand, have experienced that. I just got numbers from uh, Europe, from the OECD, and they are pretty much the same. So I'm pretty confident that this will hold true. For New Zealand. So it's not just our leaders telling us this, it's also the mental health stats. And with people being fearful and struggling with life, what's happening is this. People who are fearful don't look out in the world and are creative.
they sit back, their world shrinks. They sit back and go, hey, I can't deal with this right now. Just tell me what to do. Just tell me what to work on, tell me what to do. I'm going to do it, I'm going to do it high quality, but really I can't think. And this might not be you, personally. But go back to your workplace, to your organisations, and see if you can observe something similar, that people are anxious, struggling with life. Leaders told me that they observe an increased learned helplessness. It's the sitting back, please tell me what to do. And I would even go further. So it's a demanding helplessness. People demanding of their managers and leaders that they solve all their problems. They can't think right now. I don't know if you're familiar with the concept of learned helplessness, but fundamentally it's how feeling powerless shapes behavior. It comes from uh, 1967 psychology, Martin Seligman, and he coined this term. And it means, I'll give you an example actually. Say, say you're trying to get really fit. And you start on this journey and you get your nutrition together and you start going to the gym and then you get injured. And you keep going and you keep working and you hit that plateau and nothing much happens. And at some point, you decide, well, maybe I'm just not cut out to be this fit person. And you kind of give up and you stop doing something. And it's that feeling when whatever it is, whatever it is you do, it doesn't really have that much of an impact on the outcome. I see it at work. I see it at work all the time. It's people who are asking to be spoon feed tickets. You go to stand ups. You go to stand up and it's like, well, I'm working on ticket, ticket number 4786. I'm working on 779. And you do this round and you go, what are you even talking about? There is no customer outcome, there's no what it is you really work on. You're just working on a ticket. I also see it when I as an agile coach, sometimes observe spring planning meetings, for example. People sitting back, just staring at the product data, just tell me what to work on, give me a ticket, just tell me what to do. And they're demanding cut up requirements, documents, without ever asking what are we doing, why are we doing it, and who benefits. And so they just tell me what to do. One product manager taught me it's remarkable the extent to which people will go in order to avoid thinking. And if you think it's totally not me, I thought, I thought it's totally not me until he gave an example. He said, well, it's watching all those people using ChatGPT or Copilot and then just blindly accepting the response to a prompt without thinking about it, without checking, is it the right solution? Does it make sense? Is it irrelevant? We all do it sometimes, but I do think it's part of a wider and bigger problem, especially if it's that behavior that starts being ingrained of like, oh, just tell me what to do. You might wonder why this is a problem in the first place. Because you go to work, you do as you're being told to do, what's the problem? I think you're not okay if you're doing this. I think you're not okay, your team's not okay, and your organisation is not okay. Because first of all, people are not thinking as broadly as they should. Right, here we all are. How many of you are agile coaches? How many years have we spent talking about systems thinking? Only to sit back and say, oh, actually, I'm making my world really, really small. 
So people are not thinking broadly enough. They, people who are fearful and suffer from anxiety, they can't look up, they can't make connections between different fields and different ideas. They won't think creatively. And that's a problem because in our organisations, creativity and innovation just takes a deep dive. So it matters. It also matters when it comes to meetings and productivity. The GM at uh, one major Australian telco said, people just showing up for meetings, mistaking presence for impact. And I think this is true. People just blindly sometimes accept any meeting invite they get. Just accept, accept, accept. And then you get this huge meeting bloat where you can't ever get to talk to anyone because everyone's always in meetings all the time. And it's a problem because, again, we can't we don't have the time to actually do our work. We don't have the time to be creative. And I actually just want to check who thinks they have too many meetings. Do you love meetings? Quite a lot, so one of you. Surprised about that? Well, I definitely have too many meetings. If you think you're in too, or in general, if your calendar is full of meetings, when's the last time you checked? whether you really need to be there. I mean, are you contributing? Are you learning something? If not, do you really need to be there? Or can someone just tell you at the end what was decided? So I encourage all of you to um, just check your calendars, decline the meetings you don't have to be at, and if you think you have to be there, check your assumption. Think about if this is actually true. And the sitting back being taught what to do is also a problem because it makes us unhappy. Because for the last 10 years, we have known what motivates us at work. We know this because Daniel P told us. Autonomy, mastery, purpose. And this is the opposite of autonomy. To make matters worse, there's also a link that research has proven. There's a link between learned helplessness and anxiety and depression. So it's not a good thing. So all of this, increased learned helplessness, loss of autonomy, loss of innovation and creativity, have led us to this place where I really believe we need to do something. And before we, we race out and go, hey, we've got to do something, we need to look at what have we done so far. And our organisations are actually not bad at this. There's quite a lot of focus on wellness. There's, there are mental health, health days where people can just take time off when they feel they can't cope going to work. Who has mental health days in their companies? Quite a lot, yep. There are mental health days, there is, um, there's meditation offers, there are yoga offers, and I think that's great stuff. I think it's amazing that organisations have become aware of this and are doing something about it. But I also think there's a flip side. And I've seen that flip side, working with a company that had unlimited mental health days. And you just go to work in the morning and uh, Slack would just pop up. I was going, mental health, mental health, mental health, mental health. And people would basically at the slightest sign of stress would go, oh, got to stay home, mental health day. And what that does is, well, it increases your work-life balance, but you're sacrificing everyone else. There are other people who need to work more. There are leaders and managers who now worry about how they can work when people are, when you can't predict when people are coming to work and when they aren't. 
and I still fully support trusting people, having mental health days, and all the other wellness options. But I also think that we need to look at or making sure that the pendulum hasn't swung too far. That we still keep in mind that what we do, our actions have consequences for other people at work. And they also create a dependency if we're depending for our wellness and our happiness and our organisations. This is one of my favourite quotes from one of the leaders I spoke to. The workplace is being considered as the 1950s husband ought to be. They are to cater to all our needs. Emotional security and economic security. Protection and freedom from being challenged. And it's so true. I remember bringing our whole selves to work. Making sure that we have friends and a social life at work. And then we want to have our weekly one-on-one -on -one with our managers, which is basically have half an hour to an hour where we could just talk about ourselves and then. And those aren't bad things, but I do think there is too much of this. And it's not good for our managers and leaders because they now have to act as the 1950s husbands. They feel they need to take care of everything. They feel they're just giving, 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 being responsible for everyone's happiness. One of them taught me, people forget that we're people too. But also as employees or people, this is not working. Because we act like the 1950s housewives. Leaning back, being taken care of. And that's the opposite of autonomy, which makes us happy. And after all, we spent the last, what, 20 years trying to tell people that we are not factory workers, we are knowledge workers. Trust us, we're creative, we need to do this. So this doesn't match up. And I think very, and I think this is a huge threat for all the things we've been fighting for the last 20 years. The ways of working, which are based on autonomy, mastery and purpose. So I think, very much like the women of the 1950s, we need to emancipate ourselves. We need to get back our autonomy, independence and responsibility. So this is a rallying cry for action. And the action would you like me to tell you not to do it? <laughs> <laughs> yes, Jim is too anxious. I can't tell you exactly what to do, but I do have three things that, uh, three guidelines that I'd like to get. And before I do so, just for our um, excitement, we're going to have some more. <laughs> First one is, I'd like you to train your resilience muscle. And by resilience, I don't mean just soldier on, push through, because that's stupid. Resilience is the ability to bounce back from adversity. It's the ability to adapt to changing circumstances and win. And like a muscle, it needs to be trained. And if we don't use it, we'll lose it. There's a lot of research currently being done on athletes, on the athlete population, something that's quite close to my heart, where people look into elite athletes and try to figure out what makes them succeed. One of my favourite pieces of research is um, published in Angela Duckworth's book called Great. 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 And what she found out was that um, every elite athlete had to go through some kind of adversity and through setbacks. In other words, 
If you've never had any experience with adversity or overcoming setbacks and have developed the resilience to get through this, no chance that you're going to be on an elite level. And then there's research building on that that I also really, really love, which is by Matt Fitzgerald. Matt Fitzgerald published it in a book called The Comeback Quotient. What he looked at was um, all the elite athletes who did overcome adversity, many of them, how did they do this? And he found out that they all had a framework that was really similar, or they all used the same framework, consciously or subconsciously. And that's the framework I'd like to share with you now. And it starts with accepting reality. Just staring reality in the face and accepting it as it is. No denial, no pretending it's any better than it really is. No hoping or wishful thinking or rose tinted glasses. Just accept reality. The next step is addressing reality. Address reality by taking measures to make things better. Change strategy. You might have to change tactics. You might even have to change your mindset to overcome setback. And then, at the last step, embrace reality. Wholeheartedly embracing reality means getting to a place where you don't succeed despite of the obstacle, but where you succeed because of it. Or you grow and you thrive through that adversity and make the reality, the new reality, a positive thing. As an example, I'll use artificial intelligence again. We have to accept that it's there, it exists, it's not going to go away, and it's going to have a huge impact on all of our jobs in society. Addressing it, well, keeping an open mind, being curious, learning about it, learning how to use it, and also learning about the biases and the risks and the dangers associated with it. And embracing it making it part of the way you work, integrating it into our organisations. So what I encourage you to do is to do three hard things every day a week. Use the framework to accept, address and embrace reality. And choose three things every day to do this for. Have the hard conversations. Point out the elephant in the room. Question authority. Why are we doing this? Why are you telling me just what to do? I want to know why. Do I really have to go to those meetings? Train your resilience muscle by doing three hard things each day. My second tip. To reassess and recalibrate your relationships at work. Because I think there has been this, we have had this imbalance between leadership and people. By the way, if you, you can be both. If you have a boss, you're also people. There's this imbalance, and um, I'd like you to look at every single one of your relationships at work. Think about are they equal? Or are they more like a 1950s husband and wife? And I'm not talking about abolishing formal hierarchy. There's nothing wrong with formal hierarchy. I'm talking about us as people. I'm talking about us as people. And I think we're so good at it during the lockdowns. We managed to see our leaders as people. We watched their children run through the camera. We heard the dogs have a barking fit in the background. And we're really good at separating the person from the role and see our leaders as human beings. 
I think we need to get that back. And we need to get that back by addressing our relationships at work. And I want to share with you a framework about how to do this. The very first thing is, yes, there are boxes. And I'm not going to put people in boxes. This is not a personality thing. This is about relationships. This is context dependent and we are moving around and are in different quadrants dependent on the relationship and the context. With that out of the way, this is a framework I, uh, by Robert Kelly. It is also quite old, from the 1960s. And the original language was, what makes a star follower? The language, I think, wouldn't resonate anymore. So um, when I looked at it, I realized the star follower traits and behaviors are the same traits that make a great leader and are the same traits and behaviors that make for great relationships. So, he looked into it uh, across two axes, two main axes. One is behaviours around independent critical thinking, and the other one about how active is the behaviour. The quadrant that makes for the best relationships is when we are the effective players or chaps. The behaviour is that we're putting forward our own views while still supporting the organisational goals. We are okay with risk and we're coping with change. And there's also the consistency of behaviour towards all people. By that I mean not sucking up to people above us in the hierarchy, in the formal hierarchy, and being dicks to the people who report to us. At the moment, the sitting back and waiting to be told what to do, we are in the lower two quadrants. It's the dependent, uncritical thinking. It can be dependent, uncritical thinking and still be relatively active. Those people are the yes people. They are happy to do as they're being told. They will do a good job, but they don't question any orders. They just do as they're being told, happily. And the other ones are the passive players or sheep behaviour. They are dependent and uncritical in the thinking, and they also lack initiative and responsibilities and just do the tasks they're being given and then stop. And that, I think, is the problem we're facing at the moment relationships where we display those behaviours. So I'm just going to add the, uh, the last one for completion. I don't think it's that much of a problem at the moment, or it's nothing what I've heard from the leader interviews. But that's uh, the toxic people, the people who've been somewhere for too long, who are quite cynical, they're very negative, and they're basically snipers, just avoiding conflict and just like throwing a grenade every now and then. So I'd, to, I'd like to encourage all of you to go to work, look at every single one of your relationships, whether it's your peers or your manager or people who report to you. Are those relationships equal? Are the behaviours, both yours and the other people's, in the right quadrant? And if not, how have you contributed to it? Because it's always two contributed to it. How have you contributed? What behaviours need to change? And what conversations do you need to have? Gets me to my last tip. And that's especially for the leaders in the room. Give people the space to train their resilience muscle. Give them the space to succeed. And what I'd like you to do is kill the advice monster. Do you know the advice monster? Some of us sitting right here. Every single one of us has it. 
on your right shoulder is the advice monster. And whenever you have a conversation and someone starts venting, talking about their problems, it just pops up. It goes, I know, I know, I, 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 I know what to do. And it just wants to talk. What I'd like you to do is when it pops up, just make a fist, punch it in the face, keep it down. And instead of giving advice immediately after two sentences, just lean back, listen, and ask questions. Like, what's the real challenge here? What else? What would you like from me? And then for God's sake, listen to the answer. So overall, I think we need to embrace agility to win at the new ways of working. Reality has changed. We need to accept it, address it, and embrace it. And none of us knows yet exactly what the new ways of working are going to look like. So we need to run small experiments. We need to try things out, have short feedback loops, and learn from it. And we need, we need to do it together as a team. Leaders, managers, employees, people, everyone. We can't figure it out by ourselves. And we need to fix our relationships in order to figure it out. And now I'm coming back to the favour that I was going to ask you. I'd like you to go back to your organisations, look out for any of those symptoms that you might recognise, and then run experiments. And let everyone, or maybe just me, know how they're going. Because I think we can learn from each other here. Putting up a little cheat sheet with um, your instructions for what to do next. And my email address so you can tell me about your experience. Thank you. If you have any questions, shoot, and I'll give you the microphone. Going back to what you were saying before about the tickets and stand-ups and things, do you feel we've lost our purpose as well? Yes, I, I actually do think so. Um, and it's... Personally, and uh, there's nothing that came through in, in the interviews as personal opinion, I think we have lost our purpose and uh, one of the reasons is that many of us have been rethinking our lives what's important, what not, what's not so important. And um, organisations are doing that too. So um, the very long answer to your question is yes. Okay. Anyone else? Also, if you've got any statements or you want to say anything, feel free. Talking to the leaders, do you think they genuinely knew how to get people to buy into the vision? Because this is what it is, so that question by Sam, I guess. But, um, what I've observed is you get a lot of leaders going, why are my people not autonomous? They want me to think for them. And then do the thinking for them. <laughs> yes, and I think that's where the advice monster comes in. The um, hey, um, can you go and solve this? And they give you, um, I fully delegate to you, and then you get a room, there's nothing coming back, and then the advice wants to pops up, and you start talking as a leader. So uh, yes, that's a skill. And I also think it goes both, or it, it, it's two things, like, um, oh, first of all, let me say, like, some leaders are just bad, like, some people are bad, not everyone's super qualified and amazing. But let's talk about the good ones. And um, I do think it's quite easy to fall into trap to um, try to get people 
um, to give people autonomy and then we get absolutely nothing back because they feel anxious and they don't currently want to or they come from different workplaces where um, that was not okay. So um, then they often revert to telling people what to do. People go, oh, you're telling me what to do. I don't have autonomy and it's just this vicious circle. Is that what you observe too? I think what, what I've observed is, is leaders who don't know how to break that cycle and so they keep on reverting to us. I'm literally working with leaders at the moment um, who thankfully self-aware, they said, okay, I don't know how to delegate to people, I haven't seen people taking responsibility, so I'm just gonna keep on doing this. And they're actually perpetuating that cycle themselves and, and I sort of, and as your point to you sort of making the point that it's on the people to break that cycle, the leaders to break that cycle, it affects both. I think it's absolutely a boat, and uh, that's what I think. This talk is from the perspective of leaders. So, and I think um, we have said all the, or there has been so much about how art leaders need to delegate, how leaders need to trust people. And I think that's absolutely true. And the part that I think is missing is looking at the other side. It's not just leaders, it's also us having to take some responsibility. So just thinking some of it's related to um, psychological safety and maybe in this work around how we frame uncertainty and how we then invite uh, feedback and thinking and challenge around that uncertainty and that, that's both sides. That's asking good questions as a worker. I'm seeing something here, can I have some time with you to discuss it? And from the leader, I don't have all the answers to this thing I'm asking you to do and provide some feedback goes both ways, but when we frame things in a deterministic way, that's the side of the, we're creating a genetic state as well. And we can create a genetic state by being afraid to feedback, but it, you know, it is definitely two sides. Thank you very much. Um, okay, cool, lots of questions. agency and decision-making power. I just wondered what you meant by agency in that context, because I didn't quite get it. Um, by agency, I, I just meant the... Um, <laughs> half deaf no, my left ear. Um, I meant just the, um, the ability and permission to um, be in um, be in charge of your own destiny to make decisions to um, not just be taught what to do but um, to decide yourself what you're doing. Kind of having voice in the thing. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, you had some really great quotes from the leaders. I was just wondering. What were the questions you were asking them that were triggering those quotes? Um, I'm trying to remember, but um, <laughs> I was trying to use all the questions that I had read in all the coaching books, like uh, how open that they need to be. And um, it's also people that I, a lot of people that I know quite well to have a conversation and to, um, like I had a back, number of background questions but mainly tried to have a conversation around it and now it's somehow. Um, what was the your subject of framing? Um, oh, I know that a lot has, um, a lot has changed for, uh, for you and for us and I'm um, just interested in uh, what are some of the things that uh, you have seen, some of the things that you're struggling with, some of the things that you wish uh, were different, um, if you um, could change anything, what, what you do, and um, I think the main is the what, um, the main one is the what are you struggling with, uh, what are you really annoyed about, what really sucks at your work right now. That's not a question. <laughs> and I found the more informal you are about it, the easier it is to use work, words where what's annoying, what sucks. And as much as I could face to face, yeah. 
with um, fragility, there's this kind of um, repetitive, low-level destruction and rebuilding on, let, let's call it, shitty foundation mm -hmm. kind of thing. It, it's kind of its own unique problem as to how to stop that cycle going on. And does that more or less get addressed by your number one there, or is there something specific to that stage that you would recommend in, in some sense? in this metaphor, like getting over it, like building something more solidly so that to not be so fragile. I, I really don't want to get into some kind of life coaching or anything that I'm absolutely not qualified to do. But personally, I do think um, it is building that resilience by um, doing hard things at work. And something that works for me personally is building resilience through sports. Um, I don't know what works for other people. It could be other work things or um, hobbies. Yeah. It's a great question. I, yeah, I feel a bit nervous about um, crossing the border into that life coaching type of thing. Thanks, Andy. I'm really curious to understand more. So we want greater autonomy in the workplace, yes. We see patterns of people, I can't think, just tell me. Um, we've got learned helplessness and we want to break back those patterns. So there's some ways we can address this. We can be coaching our leaders with some of these cheat sheet options and, and guidelines that you've given us, you've shared with us today. I'm curious to know, you know, if we're thinking about coaching the system and coaching teams, and individuals within those teams, what are you noticing out there um, in terms of some ideas that maybe we could take away? What are you observing? What, what, what are you finding helpful in that space? Thanks for like a super simple question that I can easily answer. <laughs> um, so when I talk to leaders, or what I'm really aware of is that um, I can't just show up and go like, you really like the exec needs to really listen to me, and uh, I totally know, so you just need to listen this is the road to failure. What I usually do is, uh, first of all, talk to the leaders, and that's not, uh, I never coach leaders. I work as their sidekick, I bounce off ideas with them, or they with me, hopefully, once I have a relationship. And, I offer help, and the help I can offer is that um, one of the leaders I talked to said, um, I'm the CEO, I can't reach down easily four levels below me, because um, if I, and especially people working from home, if I make a meeting with someone who's four levels below me, they go, oh my God, why does the CEO want to talk to me? <laughs> So with uh, a lot of hybrid working or working from home, that connection is really hard and has been lost because they now don't have the ability to um, intersect someone in the kitchen or see if someone looks like they're in a really bad place. So try to offer that kind of help. Um, and then coaching teams and people. Trying to have the conversation around what would be fun. As a team, what would be fun? Is it fun to just work on a ticket or would it be more fun to meet the person who's using your thing? Like um, I work with um, a lot with Southern Cross hospitals at the moment and um, it's not fun to work on a ticket. It's fun to talk to the nurse who uses the system and um, observe them and actually make a real connection there. And I'm trying to get people out of the habit by doing that. I don't have any control of the time or anything, by the way, and I don't know if I end up with the microphone. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so, as, as an agile advisor yourself, uh, and we're talking about resilience and Organizations are mainly looking for leaders who can lead teams, but I still see in maybe in the marketplace that we have this segregation between if you're a project manager, you know, we cannot take you as an agile project manager. 
and vice versa. If you're coming from an agile project manager, you cannot lead a team, you know, in a project management, com yeah, conventional way of working. And if we were looking at the end of the day as someone who's a leader who has a vision and who can just, you know, lead a team, remove the impediments and everything. So why, in your opinion, we have this segregation? Still enough. <laughs> I don't know why we have the segregation. Um, I think people are incredibly obsessed with the job titles and career letters, letters. Um, and I find it personally quite banal and boring. But I think it will change. And the reason why I believe it will change is there is a um, very new research paper um, by the Business Agility Institute in the Scrum Alliance. And they said that um, the number of job ads for agile coaches, for example, is going down. The number for uh, people who only have one specialty and are T-shaped is going down. What companies are looking for and are going to look for in the future is people who are pie-shaped. I mean, I mean the mathematical pie. <laughs> 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 People who have uh, at least two very deep areas of specialty and um, a broad area of knowledge. And I recommend reading that report and uh, I think it gives hope for, for that this might change in the future. Um, just to add on to your question, uh, I, I, like many of you guys, uh, one of the victims of uh, whatever you want to call it. And what I realized is the whole thing between, oh, you're an agile coach, oh, you're a scrum master, a project manager. Quite a lot of those things are dependent on also the hiring agencies. You might not realize, but they don't understand. Uh, because I mentioned, hey, I'm a scrum master. Oh, no, no, we're not looking for a scrum master. We only want agile coach skills. And I was looking, okay, fine. Uh, you don't understand what's happening here. So uh, a lot of times I've observed that the recruitment agency just want those specific names in the resume. They don't care what you have done. They don't understand remotely what you have done. And even if you try to explain, they're like, ah, I don't see that name, sorry. You're already rejected, so. Can I give you some personal advice? Um, which is just stuff that has worked for me. Recruiters, it's generalization. They do buzzword matching. And the way to go about getting a job is having the coffees as much as possible, um, present somewhere, um, do a talk, and maybe outside of Agile, uh, but HR events um, where people see you. So um, what has worked for me, and I, I've been in a position where um, 15 years ago, I want to get a job because I don't have New Zealand, I don't have New Zealand experience. And I was coming from Sony Ericsson in Europe and um, that wasn't worth anything until I had done a web page, and I mean a web page for Mr. Whippy. <laughs> and I think as a piece of advice, um, yeah, have the coffees, cut out the recruiters if you can. We'll get a good recruiter. You can say something too if you're okay. Hi, Sandy, nice to see you again. Um, I um, I love the cheat sheet, and um, for, for me personally, all three of those um, items resonate a lot. I'm interested to hear if you've got any views on um, particularly number two there, um, behaving like a, a champ player. Um, how might we go about uh, setting that expectation for our people to behave like champ players and uh, to to uh, like set, encourage them to to be uh, to to think and behave in that in that way, um, as well as like ourselves, we can be self-aware, but how, how do we set that expectation with others? That's a great question. 
and I'm not just saying that because I don't know what the saying is. <laughs> um, I really do like the question, and I think what I, I would do about it, and what I usually do is, it really helps just acknowledging the problem, the, even when I am in a leadership position, to go, hey, I think we've got a problem, I think this is what the problem is. Share the model, maybe? The yep. Yeah, I would take this year and um, I came to think about something, I think we have this problem, can we solve it together? And I think no one can solve it on their own, it's because it's a relationship problem. Okay, so you sit. Um, I'm interested in your thoughts, think of it as kind of a system, a complex system. I'm interested in your thoughts about information flows and transparency. They seem to be quite important to me, observing successful leaders and successful relationships. Is that your observation? Yes, absolutely. I think transparency helps, openness helps, acknowledging what's going on totally helps. That being said, I don't think that Everyone needs to have every piece of information. In all cases, there's some things that are confidential. I think that's okay. I also think that not everyone wants to have all the information. I, yeah, I remember working for a company and they share excruciating detail on the financial stuff. <laughs> tell me if we go bankrupt. Tell me if we do amazing. Anything in between, I'm bored. <laughs> <laughs> but um. Um, to your question, uh, I do think transparency is good, especially with um, things that people find interesting and are aware of and that fits them directly. So can you change the, their view of reality? Can the, some people have a different view of reality because they don't have the full picture or the, the yeah. right information? Yeah, I um, totally agree. And I think no one ever has. Um, not a leader, not any individual team member, and uh, that's how we create a full picture by sharing those perspectives. We're all biased, we are a small slice of the truth. Um, so your company off and you're in control if you need it? Yeah, um, normally about seven, but I don't want to start with the Okay, but I'm aware the doors are locked. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I was just curious because you interviewed leaders across a couple of different countries and just being working in New Zealand, it's multicultural. Um, I was just curious if you saw any variability in different countries or leaders from different cultures or employees based in different cultures or um, yeah, any themes and if so, if, what would be your advice if a leader is moving from one culture to another? Um, and what kind of questions will help them to navigate and recalibrate themselves in that new environment? So, basically, can you tell me how to solve any cultural problem in your context? Great question. <laughs> Apart from, I don't know, <laughs> there is nothing much of a difference that I have observed. That being said, countries were in New Zealand, Australia, US, and um, Europe, and by Europe I mean um, Scandinavia and Central Europe, Austria, Germany. So if there are any differences in the UK, I wouldn't know. If there are differences, uh, like Asian cultures is something I know very little about, and probably make a complete fool of myself if I even moved to Japan or somewhere. You could look up the power index research. Say something. Yeah. That's fine. So power index, like there's some research around that, the yeah. different power relationships and organizations and how much you can say to leaders and kinds of yeah. It's uh, research by Gani uh Gert or Geert Hofstede. How do you G-E-R-T. <laughs> <laughs> G E R T H I O F Stadium S T E D E. I was just playing some Dutch. <laughs> and 
yeah, he did that research on the, the power of index and how much you can, of what you can say to the limb when. Cool. Um, thanks everyone for coming, and um, I think I'll close this. Um, Ziggy is a, like a, he's like basically like a sprinter up there, trying to come. Come, uh, thanks everyone for coming, and uh, I'll give the microphone back to Ziggy if you want to yep. do anything. Okay.